Okay, cool. Uh, it's 11 a.m. Let's get started. So thank you everyone for attending my talk today. My name is Shirley Yang, and I'm an engineering manager in LinkedIn. Today we're going to talk about how LinkedIn stabilized and GenAI first data lake house by providing 20,000 ephemeral clusters every year. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in LinkedIn for seven years. Currently, I'm working in LinkedIn's big data platform team. So there are two areas I'm responsible for. One is the foundations team, uh, which is handles all horizontal stuff within the offline stack, including developer productivity. That is how we build this product. Uh, security, um, cost efficiency, as well as some of the resilient stuff. The other area is the um, LinkedIn Airflow team, where we are working on all the data processing jobs and also some of the workflow orchestration within LinkedIn. Okay, so agendas today. We will start by talking about our pro um, problem statements and we will share our approach on solving this problem as well as the results. We'll also share some of the learnings and continuous development. We'll summarize our talk lastly and also we'll touch a little bit on our next steps. When I talk about uh, 20K ephemeral clusters, I want to first share about the LinkedIn offline stack and our uh, what the clusters, our ephemeral clusters are simulating. So currently, LinkedIn has about 10 plus Hadoop clusters, which can be transferred to more than 35K total nodes and 4 plus extra by storage. So we run 500K jobs per day. Uh, this can be transferred to around 100 million containers allocations every day. Now the whole offline stack, we have 100 engineers working on that, which includes both devs and SREs. And, and we are maintaining uh, 30 plus core services. We will keep growing on that. Our users are definitely the whole LinkedIn, uh, including AI engineers, data scientists, analysts, and everyone who actually requests access for the offline stack. So what are the challenges if we're running at such a large scale? So I want to share two examples here. These are two Slack messages. I um, took a screenshot. So the first one is actually a machine learning error. From emoji, you can see our AI engineers are pretty frustrated because the 11 hours job failed again. And the reason was because the um, they trying to release the checkpoint and it failed due to an HDFS connection error. And uh, the second one is actually um, kind of a common issues within uh, LinkedIn because we our services are interdependent among each other. And in this specific case, uh, it's Trino. So Trino was trying to release a backward incompatible change, uh, which broke the Jupyter notebook that data scientists and, and engine, AI engineer used a lot, uh, completely blocked them for a couple hours until they fully wrote it back. So when you have such a large scale and you have all these services interdependent with each other, your infrastructure just become very unpredictable. On the other hand, um, our business, as every other company, are to continue growing. So LinkedIn has transitioned its business to an AI and machine learning centric. So here, we constantly have multiple big initiatives all going on at the same time. So here is a screenshot, well, sorry, see here is basically a snapshot of the current ongoing uh, initiatives. At the top level, we, so the, uh, the orange one here are actually the ones, it's a new initiatives. So at the top level, we are heavily investing on the data pre-processing and training. We introduce the Magtron DeepSpeed and large language models to our stack. And to support those at the pipeline level, we introduce the flight, which is actually famous for its fast iteration on, on the machine learning workflow orchestration, as well as Airflow, uh, which is a replacement of the previous Azkaban to orchestrate the data processing jobs. In the compute layer, we are shifting entirely from uh, Young to Kubernetes, and we are introducing Spark on K8 to our stack, as well as also experimenting on using Volcano for the offline uh, workload uh, scheduling. Metadata layer, so we, we are adopting unified SQL uh, on top of our Apache Iceberg. So LinkedIn just open sourced its um, product, Open House, I think a couple of weeks ago. So if you're interested, feel free to, tr uh, to check that on the GitHub. Lastly, we are actually adopting object storage. So LinkedIn is currently building its own object storage, and um, which is a best for um, better for the I/O and read uh, read write throughput for machine learning. 
Uh, one reason is, as I showed before, uh, sometimes the HDFS is not, not that stable, so we want to eliminate that issues. Another is um, you, we want a faster say, throughput in terms of, say, data set and storing the experiments and uh, even the code. Across the stat, we're actually doing a security revamp. So um, currently, LinkedIn is still using the um, Hadoop delegation token. So with all of these changes within our stack, it's no longer can satisfy our needs. So we are leveraging a uh, Spiffy token as well as the Spire, and we wanted to say adopt the RBAC and pack based C security mechanism. How does our engineer feel about all of this? Um, of course, our engineers are very excited to work on all new initiatives, like every other engineer, right? So on the other hand, um, they actually are afraid of making new changes. Two examples here. The first one is the last full Hadoop update was September 2021. Even though this message was written seven months ago, it's still around two years without any of the full Hadoop updates. So a lot of new changes were not able to say uh, capturing our stack. Um, the second one is a coordination among our engineers when they try to release changes to our client libraries. In LinkedIn, all the clients of the offline stack are in a uh, single mono repo. The reason we did this before is because we want to make sure that, say, we always keep backward in uh, compatibility when we release these changes among the stack. Now, uh, for after a couple of years, our stack grows, our say number of say engineers grows. So this has actually become a bottleneck. So consider you have a hundred engineers all say contribute to the, the same code base. You actually are very scared of say releasing product say issues, or causing product issues when you are releasing change. So our engineer actually needs to constantly think about backward compatibility, forward compatibility, and all of these things. So and um, basically, you can see they are e they're even a little bit fear of say um, releasing the change, and the result is we actually last year we actually seen once that there are 15 versions without getting released in our client say libraries, which actually cause a big production issues. So we start to debug this issue, right? And we need to solve it. Uh, like every other company, our development cycle is we develop, we build, and we deploy to production. Now, because LinkedIn is having such a large scale and we have so many clusters, the bottleneck is when you deploy to all of these clusters. So consider you deploy to one of the static clusters and it takes a couple of days. And now if you find a bug and now you have to say, all go back, you, you need to roll back and go back to fix it, the process, all the process again. So it may take a couple of weeks and eventually when you release to all the production clusters, it may take a couple of months. So it's pretty bad. So we started to think about this. What if we can just say taking something ephemeral and we can run all of this, spin it up within 10 to 20 minutes so our uh, engineers can basically just ta uh, test on top of this ephemeral cluster. And if we can simulate the production clusters, then they basically can just test ephemerally. So the whole process will be you deploy a cluster for a couple minutes, right? Say, and you run your test, assuming everything okay, you say having a, in a couple hours, everything should be good. And even the worst case, it may take one or two days for you to fix everything. Now the overall process of releasing to the whole production can be re reduced from weeks to months to just say days, right? So at most a couple weeks. So it's basically will be a large produc productivity increase. That's why how we introduce the Groundhog Day. The idea is we take a, a snapshot of all the offline st stack and then we bundle it and we allow our user to be specify their um, production, um, the production config they want so that we can say take a snapshot of all these clusters uh, and run it on Kubernetes so that they can run tests. So as you can see, the name comes name come from the movie Groundhog Day and what it means is we can run it over and over again. So um, as our uh, user are mainly the platform engineers, so the goal we wanted to make sure is we have simple UX and we wanted the learning curve for our engineers as low as possible and we want to allow them to be able to integrate this product everywhere they want. So I want to show a demo on how the Groundhog Day works and I hope it works. And I hope the font is not too small, but if it's small, I can show it the one in the local. It's good enough? Okay. 
So basically, it's taking a JSON config, as you can see, and you can put some cluster-level configs, as well as some of the flow-level configs. As I mentioned, that LinkedIn supports three orchestrators, Artscape and the legacy ones, Airflow and Flight. So basically, in the type here, you are able to put all of these things based on your need. Every, um, because every orchestrator, the way it defines a flow is different, so you will need to put some of the flow level, say config and metadata there. So our system can automatically create um, the flows for you. So in this example, it's showing Azkaban. So you will need to define what they have a concept is a project and then flow. If it's an airflow, you will just have a DAC. So, um, and then say, the demo just shows some and the zip file is actually where your test, the code for your test, uh, which we download directly from um, the artifactory. And um, basically then it will be used automatically to execute the, the flows. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit so that we don't spend too much time. Um, so as I mentioned, we want a simple UX. So basically this thing is, uh, we have a, U a CR, uh, CR, sorry, CRI uh, to say execute our flow. And in this example, we actually integrate um, with our um, pre-commit, so the CI process. And once I wanna mention one thing is, this cluster ID here, it's a UUID. Um, the reason is at any time we have um, a many, say, ephemeral clusters running our Kubernetes namespace. And I wa we wanted to allow our users to be able to access their ephemeral clusters. So we need a uni unique identifier. Um, in this one, it shows that starts with H5 view. I'm gonna show that in the ephemeral um, orchestrator UI, you will also find this. Um, then, so this is basically saying that all the flow has executed successfully. So it's not showing clear here, but I'm gonna show it later. So the remaining thing, it will be say the same experience as you just run a flow in a normal static cluster. So in this one, it's because it's using Azkaban, so it, you will see an Azkaban uh, UI. And as I mentioned that in the URL, you will have this UUID identified. And basically say um, also, so to allow our users to easily use, use this, find this URL, we basically already construct this in our log. It's in the CLI output, so the user can directly just click on it. And it's also showing here this UUID, um, so that you, when you're actually logging on, so consider you're a user and you have multiple, um, say, uh, ephemeral cluster, you know which one you wanna find. Remaining things are just say, uh, you need to log in as a normal user. Um, this, this is the same integration as for a production cluster because we want to make sure that even when you're testing, you actually ensure your the whole uh, security flow, the authentication is working. On um, all of these projects, you define it in the configs and it's automatically created. And remaining thing is you have your flows in the project and executions and then your DAG and your flow logs, which you can use for debug, as well as your job logs. So in addition to that, sometimes uh, not all the logs you can find in orchestrator, right? So for example, if you have a Spark application, uh, it depends on where your what your scheduler is. When we developed this, we were still using Yarn. So um, I have this say demo using Yarn. So basically if user wants to um, debug using um, for its a specific Spark application, you actually need to go to the Yarn resource manager in the UI. And we also output this URL in our log so user can just directly click. And as you can see that say, uh, it's basically the same experience as a static cluster. So, Basically, you click on that and you can find your logs. Okay, cool. So the next thing is the result here. So as I mentioned, uh, Groundhog Day, we enable developer to be able to provision um, our data lake house clusters on the fly using Kubernetes. And user can integrate anywhere, uh, spin up on a dev box or integrate with their CI command. And we also allow user to be able to customize the production uh, environment in, in their configs. 
And now, um, after we launch this product, say we see our compute team, the CI success rate has increased from 68.1 to 81.7%. And the storage team, the CI success rate has increased from 76% to 87.5%. Uh, scale here, I mentioned we run 20K. So the real data is we run 23.5K ephemeral clusters every year and 500K flows. And now since we launched it last year, we have captured 2.1K to a more than 2,000 flow failures in pre-commit. What it means is um, 2,000 um, bugs and production issues have been captured before the code is even released into any of the cluster. Architecture here, we are in a KubeCom, so you can assume that everything is deployed using Kubernetes. So both the uh, control plan and the data plan in our cluster, in our Kubernetes, uh, sorry, in our Groundhog Day clusters are deployed using um, Kubernetes and internally the control plan contains two services, orchestration service and a history service. So the name, the responsibility is as the name suggests is orchestration service is talk to the Kubernetes uh, API to spin up these ephemeral clusters. History service, um, it includes all the metadata for every of the executions so user can just debug, inspect or replay their executions. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we are able to say mimic the production environment. So uh, the way we do it is we actually integrate it with our central release system. It's a source of a truth for all the versions deployed in all the environment. So basically, it's whenever a user uh, specify the environment they want to put, it's an enum. We will just talk to our central release system, and they'll give us a list of, say, the services and the versions they deploy in their environment. So what we do is we're going to um, override um, in our user specified hem chart so that they know when uh, Kubernetes spin up the cluster and know say, okay, this is the right image I need to download and spin, spin up. Um, the data plane contains a group of say Kubernetes resources which are used to say create these flows I showed it before as well as to um, execute the executions. And users are, are able to access their ephemeral clusters through an edge proxy, which I actually showed a URI before. And uh, if users want to log on to a specific container, uh, they can just use the normal say, Kubernetes way, like port forward. Um, after we launched this, first thing we wanted to ensure is we wanted to keep this platform as stable as possible. So the first thing you do is metrics. Now, uh, as we inspect our metrics in our ephemeral clusters, we notice our metrics are either sparse or has no data. It's basically show as this. It doesn't work, right? So we started to debug a little bit, and we noticed that the reason was because uh, in LinkedIn, the metrics were actually not multidimensional. What it means is consider you have a simple REST service and you emit, say, status code, right? So the number of status you emit, for example, you have four, and it will become, say, four single graphs. So it's not ideal, but it's still workable for um, the rest of services because in the end you have finite number of say status codes. But it doesn't work for our ephemeral case um, because say our ephemeral clusters come and go and everything spin up is different. So we definitely need to solve this problem. And as every our every Kubernetes service, the first thing we need to think, we think about is we want to integrate with the Prometheus SDK. Um, how do we do it? Is like everyone else, we're thinking about using Open Telemetry. And we do this by uh, expose different um, client to our users uh, if they want to use this tool. And basically, is for us, we are using the Prometheus SDK, and we also have the status D client open because we want to keep backward compatible in case they wanted to, say, continue using our um, LinkedIn-provided internal metric service. So every host, there will be an hotel agent, and we expose the uh, one single protocol, the OLTP protocol. Uh, on the metrics collector side, so uh, for ourselves, we use the OTL gateway. It's also open source so that we can have a nice UI, the Grafana UI, and we can also integrate with M MDM, which is a Microsoft developed the uh, metrics service. And um, as you can, and also Cooster Invent, as you can imagine, LinkedIn is also a Microsoft company. So we try to say adopt our own things as much as possible. Uh, on the other hand, we also actually get a fork of the open telemetry so that we can uh, do some improvement and we can say ingest the data, ingest the metrics to our um, conventional metrics, metrics system, which is called InGraph, as shown in the first say, um, screenshot before. Now, after we release this, and for ourselves, we definitely see a very nice say, graph, and not only for the operational metrics, we also enable business metrics in our the same Grafana dashboard. And 
business metrics are actually very important for myself because as a manager, you want to showcase the impact. Uh, operational metrics are good for our own costs. We, have, we can have alert and metrics to inspect. Uh, not only that, uh, these two actually have been uh, adopted by every service who either in LinkedIn, who either wanted to say pull from an open source or try to say uh, open source themselves. For example, the open source, uh, so open house service I mentioned before, uh, built on top of the uh, Apache iceberg. So eventually, uh, we work with the monitoring infra team uh, in LinkedIn, and we hand off this tool. So and they are developing on top of it. Now it's become a general tool in LinkedIn for all the Kubernetes use cases. Is metrics enough, right? So um, metrics help you to detect, but does it help you to actually debug your issues? Um, this is this a screenshot or the Slack message is our user who reach out to us. They're like, say, hey, our integration task has failed. How do I debug, right? So if you run tests, you know, integration tasks, it's good because it helps you to test all the compatibility among your dependencies, but it doesn't help you. Sometimes it's hard for you to debug. You don't know whether it's your code issue, your dependency issue, or it's an infrastructure issue. So you want to find a way to quickly debug. Another thing is from our engineer, our on-call perspective is if, say, you have, uh, whenever there is an issue, you are blocking uh, every, say, user CI, so we need to quickly detect, actually not just detect, debug this issue. If it's our problem, we need to fix it ourselves. It's, it's, uh, if it's our um, component problem, like, for example, if it's Spark or HDFS because they release something bad, we need to work with them to, say, solve this problem ASAP. Now, so we definitely need to improve our debug experience so that we can quickly um, debug the issue. Um, we, are, um, we took some um, kind of uh, inspiration from an open source tool called Asas. So basically, this tool allows you to use a YAML config and on top of it, so you can just change the JVM, say, uh, you can change say, um, the debug the log level and also uh, expose the stack trace at the JVM level. Um, this tool actually works with us quite well because uh, most of our services deploy, as you can see, the Hadoop system, they are actually using um, the uh, JVM services. So we did, we did it by, say, first to say we just use the plan tool ourselves and we're using our on call. And we actually find it's pretty useful because our debug experience is much faster. Uh, after we did it for ourselves, we um, basically wanted to expose to our users. So what we do is we integrate it with our Groundhog Day CLI, and then say we expose this thing so that a user can debug. Now, after we uh, launch this thing, we actually say get a pretty good feedback from our users, and also our our own on-call ex uh, experience has been say improved a lot. Um, so takeaways, right? So what is Groundhog Day? Groundhog Day, it's an ephemeral data lake house hosted entirely on Kubernetes. And we, this product actually helped our platform engineers improve our, um, the productivity um, by increasing, enable them to say having a fa faster iteration. So along the way, uh, we also say made some foundational uh, efforts across the LinkedIn on observability. So we also improved the debugability by introducing the, um, the RSAS2 into LinkedIn. And with that, we believe that we can keep up with the pace of our ML innovations is driving. Now, this thing actually is not uh, all shiny and bright. So it takes, actually takes us two years to make. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the reason was because um, it's a horizontal problem. It's an intersection among everything. Um, in, in the offline stack, right? So, and sometimes it's really hard to actually set the ownership, right? That's one thing, um, because it's a big company and you need to actually negotiate around with different teams to make sure they agree on to, um, say, taking the on-call on board to your product and maintain this, this platform. Now, two lessons we learned. First thing is DevOps is increasingly important. So in LinkedIn, because it's a such co large company, initially we actually have a clean separation among say devs and SREs. And since last year, we are starting to transition uh, from this model to everyone needs to be DevOps. What it means is regardless of your title, you will need to write your code and you need to deploy your code and uh, monitoring your deployment and also your product. So um, it actually takes our developers, um, previously they only responsible for uh, writing a code and test. Um, they need to change their experience and they need to learn all of these tools that they were not used to. 
ham chart, Terraform, uh, coop, uh, the coop cuddle command, all of these things they need to learn. So it's taking them some of the ramp say time um, to say get used to it. Another thing is the most important part for the whole tool is it needs to be able to uh, reproduce the production environment. So basically you need to version everything. It sounds very easy, especially for everyone here, you're cloud native, it's very easy to you. But I mean, as LinkedIn is just doing this transition, it's a little bit, it's also taking some time for folks to ramp up. So initially for our SREs when they deploy, so even now, if you look at some of the documentation on Hadoop system, you will see that deployment doc, it will say that, hey, you build your RPM, you download it on your host, and you restart your service. It's not a model anymore in this cloud native world. So you need to say, um, build an image for your code. You need to say, uh, mount your config. You need to say, uh, use ham chart for your deployments. And you need to check in everything, right? So um, this actually took our SREs a while to say get used to all of this model and in the beginning, because they don't remember to say checking everything, we actually not able to say fully um, getting this say production environment mimic. So that's why the whole thing actually takes a little bit than we expected. Um, so lastly, uh, what do we want to do next? We definitely want to improve the efficiency. And uh, what I mean by that is we should be able to uh, spin up the whole cluster within five minutes. And that's why. So there are two parts. Uh, one thing is we wanted to say, why do we say that data is important, right? So we believe that data shouldn't be, continue to be a central in this AI centric world. Uh, I'm actually quoting a um, blog from uh, James Becker. He's a research engineer in OpenAI, and he actually have a very interesting blog. So I find myself very intuitive. So if you're interested, you can just check it out. My understanding on that is basically um, data, the key part of all this AI innovation is that data. So think about this, even now, um, a lot of say the big uh, institutions and even so for ourselves, we are say just use some pre-trained model, big models, and then we apply our data and then get the result we want, right? Some of the data set, which I actually was watching a show this morning is, you can just train on your local laptop, right? This, is, this will be trained. But the data pre-processing, the compute, this is the part you continuously needs to be investing. And we need to ensure that our platform engineer can actually uh, have a fast iteration on all of this. Next thing is, why do we say five minutes? This is actually from our customer feedback. So 30 minutes is basically not usable, it's too long, right? 10 to 20 minutes, most of them are willing to use it in their pre-commit. Uh, they're willing to wait this amount of time and to say, hey, um, before my code checking, just do a sanity check, right? Only if, say, we can make it in five minutes, they are willing to use it more often in their development. Basically, as you spin up something, you do some experiment in your code, you tell it on, you do more development, and then you spin it again. How do we do this? So two ways. One thing is uh, you want to cache as much as possible. Everything should be in local as much as possible, except for the necessary, uh, you want to patch the necessary diff and also say, upload the necessary jars, right? But remaining things, your images need to be local and everything, your dependency needs to be local. It just needs to be spin up. Instead of you download from a remote, say, image uh, registry. Another thing is we wanted to expose a way for our user to be able to uh, basically just selectively spinning up certain component. So think about it, if you're a Spark engineer, you probably don't care if you're um, in your ephemeral cluster, you have a Trino or, or Flink in your stack, right? You just need your orchestrator. Uh, in our case, we also need some reshuffle service. But mainly is you don't need all of these other compute engine in your cluster. You need some of the storage so that you can import the data in. Uh, that's it, right? So if by allowing our user to be able to uh, construct, uh, to selectively say, uh, choose a component they want to spin up, we can just reduce this overhead of spinning up different um, ports and different, say, spin up the services. So um, with that, uh, I actually say concluded my talk and I think we have enough time for Q&A. You hear me well? Yeah. Um, but one quick question. When you say you, um, 
you duplicate anything, everything uh, with snapshots to uh, to get your stack up and running in 25 minutes. Uh, I understood that it is about all the versions of your containers that are snapshot and, and redeployed automatically. What about the data? Because uh, most of the time the problem is to initiate with the, the accurate data similar to what is in production. Yes, yeah, so um, to repeat the question is, um, how do we say get the data in for um, our users to run the end-to-end -end test? And sometimes the um, actual accuracy is depending on data. So there are two ways for users to be able to do so. If say, mostly the user will just choose to say we um, import some data from our staging cluster. And the reason is, say, in the production cluster, there are some PI data, basically people-related data. We cannot say, from security perspective, we cannot just import. So we do have some uh, obfuscated data from our staging cluster for the production, from the production, so we can import. Of course, because it's ephemeral cluster, you cannot say, um, have, say, um, basically infinite amount of storage. So we don't expect the users to say import a lot of data. It will just couple and most I think 100 megabytes data. And because it's running the CI, so mostly is it will still for your functional testing. And we do have another say pre prod cluster which is running some of the flows for um, pre prod is they have some production data and they, they pass the security say uh, requirement to be able to run this as a, as the end sanity check before they we fully release it release it to production. Um, does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. If no question, thank you for having me today. Enjoy the rest of your um, conference.